Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Again, so here is the most basic definition of asexual versus sexual propagation that I could find. So sexual pr propagation involves the flora parts of a plant or an asexual propagation involves just taking a part of a parent plant and we cause it to regenerate into a new plant and it'll be identical to the parent. Think of some of the hybrids that you buy. And if you wanted another one, this would be the easiest way to get that. Here are some samples of different kinds of cuttings you can take. There's herbaceous, softwood, semi-hardwood and hardwood. You know, the other day I went outside and I meant to do it earlier, hoping that the roots would be there by now, but they're not. But I cut some forsythia and some pussy willow. And I want to tell you, if you want to try cuttings, a willow is the easiest thing to, to start with. I have bought cuttings of willows from different flower shows, like the Philadelphia flower show, and brought them home and and I know we started a weeping willow tree. And in a matter of like three or four years, that thing was 10 feet tall already. It was amazing. The harder the wood it might be, is the harder your cutting might take and longer it might take to take. I've never tried these, but again, a lot of this information are in some of the handouts or the links that I will give you. So. Here shows you a picture of basically what I'm talking about. So you have a plant and you cut it, and then you basically replant the tip that you cut off. So you can think of this as the mother plant. This picture shows you more of what I'm talking about. You notice how it, it's showing you where the nodes are. If the leaves are opposite, you need two nodes. And if the leaves, are, oh, I forgot the other alternate, then you only need one node. So you got a node at the top, a node at the bottom, and then you cut right below it. Now I'm gonna go and tell you about a few different cuttings you actually take for a, from plants and give you different methods to have the same result. So here's a single eye cutting, which like I said, is a plant with alternate leaves. So you cut it off and you put it in the ground and you will soon have little plantlets. If it's double eyes, again, like I said, you need two nodes or two buds per cutting. Here's a leaf petiole. So when, for leaf petiole, I think of like African violets, like it says, I have done this one many times because I have a blackberry African shirins. And in some, instances I have cut off a leaf and I've put it in a pot that is really small so it's only in a little bit of water and I keep watching daily for the roots to start and then I put it in the soil or you can just put it in the soil as well. I've done it both ways. When you do it in the water you really have to watch it because you you risk the, the leaf rotting. But African violets, peperonia and begonias are some of the easiest things to reproduce by taking leaf cuttings. And, and it all, like you said, the roots are at the bottom of the old leaf and the plantlets come out on the side. Now this is a leaf blade cutting. And when I think of this one, you see that looks like a jade. I've done this with jade in the past. I know years ago, I had a huge jade. And they're hard. They're sort of nice to work with because they're very hard to kill. But all you need is that blade. You don't need any petiole. You just need the blade and you place it in a tiny bit of soil or in, on really wet soil. You can just lay it there. I've seen it root that way too. And again, all the leaves will form at the base. This is sort of an interesting way to, to get cuttings. And I saw this years ago, and I, I swear, I think it was like in a prayer plant or something. Well, if you ever look at a begonia, it has all those little veins on it. And all you need is a very sharp implement 
you could even use like a razor and you just make a slit in each of the lanes, whole leaf on some moist soil. And in this case, it looks like they may have put it the end that you pinched off near the moist soil, but you can see all those leaflets come and you just wait for them to get to a certain side and then you can cut those wedges and you'll have a new plant. And begonias, there are so many begonias out there. If you're a houseplant person, you might be interested in trying this because some of them are expensive as potted plants. Hang on, give me one second, please. This isn't a leaf section cutting, and this would be like from a snake plant. I was trying to decide whether this would include mother-in-law's tongue too, because some people call it that instead. But with this one, you want an ind individual leaf, and then you cut it into sections to pr produce new plants. And it's a really pretty good picture there. You can see the section you want to, and when you cut this section, you want to make sure that you place the the side that you put on the soil is the same way the plant was when you cut it. You don't want to be flipping it around. And again, and like I said, in every, these, every one of these cuttings, they always refer to begonias as being an easy plant to reproduce. The one thing you need to remember when you're taking these cuttings, your plant needs to be healthy. If your plant's not healthy, don't try to reproduce it because you won't get a good specimen. Now this is sort of interesting. So you can cut two to three inches off a cane type plant like corn or Chinese evergreen, and it will get you know, lay it on the soil and it will give you a leaf, but the roots could take a very long time. But just the amount of having that in the moisture. The other thing I think of, remember when it was popular to get all that bamboo that would come in some fat, fancy container? that you would have. And I think that's basically what they did because you keep water in that constantly, which keeps all the, but you can't kill bamboo anyway. This is the picture I referred to earlier where I said there, this is the most simplest way to rep, re, reproduce a plant. So you just bend a branch down and then you fasten it where I sort of put that arrow there to show that thing is sometimes known as an earth stake. I know you can get them at Gardner's Supply because I looked to make sure they had them. I had a hard time finding, finding it at first. And they now even sell one that is huge. I mean, it's like a foot across at the top. It's for more like for fencing, but that's what these staples are usually used for. But again, you can bend it down, just put the staple, or some people just put a rock or a brick on top and from one of our other gardeners, one of the things which it mentions, I think here in this slide or the next, that if you actually sort of bend the branch enough to snap it, but not totally break away from the, the mother plant, you just take that piece and gently get it into a little bit of soil and, put, and it will even root a little bit faster. The wound encourages that stem to root. And I have found that plants that have wounds on them, it's amazing how they'll start. Like I have native honeysuckle and I'm constantly pushing um, the vines out of the way this way or, or that and trying to get them to go a certain direction. And if I make a wound and especially if it's sitting on the ground, I know in a week or so when I come back, I'll notice that it's rooting. And then I cut, you can cut those roots off and have some new vines to share with your friends or sell at a plant sale, which is what I do with them. Here's a rhizome. And if there's any one part where you really wanna make sure that it's healthy, because I find on my begonias a lot of times, if I can see these rhizomes a lot, that a lot of times it means they're not healthy anymore because the leaves have all stopped growing on them. So you want a healthy section of rhizome, which you can cut a couple inches and then just put it on your medium, which is, you know, you keep damp or wet, not overly wet. And you, you do all know that I just want to remind you, all these pots that you're using, they need to have at least one hole in the bottom so the water drains out. Don't put them in some of those cutesy pots. What you do is have a plastic pot 
that you put your medium in the cutting in and you, then you can put it in the other pot, but you gotta make sure you empty it of excess water all the time. But this is a good way, again, I said of getting more begonias, which can be expensive if you go to the nursery to buy them. So like the most important thing, like I just said, is good cutting stock. You need new vegetative growth. Don't look for some older part of the plant, plant which could be in some cases a little woody. Um, in the younger, there's a lot of plant hormones that are signaling flowering, which will help the hormones for vegetative growth. So new growth versus old growth. In new growth, you're most likely, it's likely to be pest-free and disease-free and not wilted. Like I said, if, if, that, if you see wilting on a plant, don't use that one. It's really a little too late to propagate that plant. Oh, one other thing. If you are going to propagate something like, say, an aster, which blooms in the fall, you want to remember that they're daylight sensitive in such a way when they flower. So because asters bloom in the fall, you want to cut them in the spring or early summer and vice versa. If something that is blooming in the spring, like say a rhododendron, you want to wait to the fall to take your cutting. And here we talk again about the quality of, of cutting. You want to handle it properly. And you have clean cut and you want to use a clean implement whether it's a hand pruner, a sharp pair of scissors, or a knife. You want to dis disinfect it before you start. Now, you can do this with a bleach solution, which is nine parts water, one part bleach. Or you can use a Clorox wipe. Or you can use like a bottle of the original formula for Listerine. And you just put it on a paper towel and wipe it. And a lot of times that um, an arborist will tell you that when you're pruning a plant as well, you want to do this every single cut. It just stops a plant from getting disease. And then once you have your cut, you have to maintain moisture in that cutting and you want to keep it in a cool area. You don't want to put it in the hot sun. It needs to stay above 40 degrees. Remember 40 degrees, especially as we get into early spring, because if you have your new plants outside, this can be a total disaster if the plants go below 40. This is um, a cutting, I'm thinking it reminds me of like maybe laurel or rhododendron. If there are a lot of evergreen leaves, say on the plant when you would cut it, you wanna, um, any type of leaf really, you wanna cut part of the leaf off it'll cut back and reduce the amount of transpiration, which, you know, the taking on of, of moisture. And then you wanna take some of the nodes or the lower leaves off. And then you wanna go down to the bottom and with a sharp knife again, you wanna remove some of the bark, which encourages the callus that we want to form. And I will tell you again, rhododendron is a great one to bring the branch down to the ground, the simple layering to get new ones. I, I've, nature has done it in my yard and I've ended up with a new rhododendron. But all these wounds will release hormones to promote rooting. Now to help us in our rooting, you can use some of uh, the hormone powders they have out there. Important thing is you don't, like a lot of them come in, like a little, almost like uh, prescription bottles sometimes. You wanna put your substance of uh, the hormone in something else. Here they show it, and it must be a liquid one, but I know there's powder, powdered ones either, whatever it is, you wanna put it in another container so that you don't get contamination in the jar that is holding the rooting hormone. And don't use too much because you can burn it. The cutting that is. And now we're out getting to the most important part in planting it. You want your medium to be wet. I will tell you before you, you try to put your cutting in. 
and you let and let the excess water drain out so it's evenly moist all the way through and then you can use a chopstick or a pencil or your baby finger maybe and you make a hole and then you put the cutting into the soil and then sort of pinch the soil around it you can water in them slightly but Again, you must be very careful because you could disturb the soil away from the hole, and then you'll have to fix it again. Here is, I'm showing you how the callus that I was talking about forms. You can see where those nodes are, and it, they try to show you those where, are where the roots may then come out. We decrease the amount of moisture, and you, and um, humidity is in the plant, and that makes it want to draw up water, which helps the roots develop. And the um, excess water or moisture can also thin your roots, which makes it hard for the plant to form oxygen. So you got to be careful. You don't overwater. Water can be your enemy if you're not careful. So now we're going to go on to sowing seeds, which is really fun to see what comes from a little bit of work. Here in the upper left corner, you'll see some of those peat pods that come like in a netting of sorts, and they're completely dry when you buy them. So you got to wet those all first, and you want to squeeze all that excess water out. To the right is an example of soil blockers. Um, there is a gardener down in Newport News. Her name's Lisa Ziegler. She has a website. It's under the Gardener's Workshop. And she sells these products if you're interested. You see the slide to the right of it shows you what you end up getting. And I know when she starts her annual seeds, she uses blocks that are only about a half an inch square. But these are all the different ways you can containers you could put seeds in to start them, including old milk jugs down there. So why try propagating from seeds? Because it doesn't require any specialized techniques, just a little time. And under the right con conditions, seeds can be stored for a long time too without you losing their viability. And it's one of the most efficient methods to get more plants quickly and cheaply. And they're not hard to transport around either. Why are some species almost never grown from seed? It's because they're hybrids. And when they come, when they grow, they sometimes resort to whatever plant they were crossed or grafted to. So think of all the echinacea coneflowers out there in different colors. Oftentimes, if you take seed from one of those plants, after a season or two, it reverts back to being a purple coneflower again, and instead of being orange or yellow or white. It's better to um, propagate those plants by a cutting. And again, a cutting gives you a bigger plant faster than a seedling, a, a, um, a plant from the seed, excuse me. So now about ordering your seeds, you want to make sure that you get them from a reputable, reputable dealer. I looked online um, before I started today, and it's a lot of the names you've heard before, like burpees, gurneys. Seed Saver is an amazing one. Their catalog is huge. They charge you for it. I paid $20 for it once for the simple reason I really wanted to see what kind of seeds they have in them. But the cool thing is they have seeds from all across the country and many of them are free. You just send the seed saver, you know, your, your address and they send you seeds. Some of the harder to come by seeds, which is what I was looking at, like San Marzano tomato seeds, you have to pay for. Uh, there's Southern Exposure Seed, which is right here in Virginia. 
It's amazing. They have heirloom seeds. That, that company has gone out of their way to collect heirloom seeds so that they won't go away. And I found another one called So True Seeds that's in Asheville, North Carolina, too. It's sort of nice to get the seeds from our area instead of another area. Not that all the seeds we're going to start are going to be natives, but if they were natives, you'd want seeds from our part of the country. Um, from seed catalogs, you can get hybrids, which in some cases, you know, they'll have uniformity and they're disease resistant. And here I'm thinking of vegetables more so than um, annuals or perennial plants. Collecting seed saves money. It allows us sometimes to have varieties that you can't find commercially. It, like some of the things you saw as a child that your parents or your grandparents had in their gardens, they're not all sold as much commercially anymore. And these are great seeds, you know, that you can save. And common self-pollinated nine hybrid what, and annual veggie seeds are a wonderful thing to save because then you aren't buying them every year. But remember, seed from F1 hybrids may not reproduce a plant that looked exactly like the plant you have. Now we have to harvest seeds. This is a columbine, which are one of the easiest seeds to collect. For one thing, you know when they're getting ready because you go over and shake the stem and you, it, it's just like a, a castanet or something. You're more, you can hear the little seeds rattling around in there. So you want to save that healthy seed. You want a pulpy fruit. You do not want to wait until they're old and starting to get mushy. A good example of what you don't want, if you have common milkweed in your yard and, you, and when the pods open, you want the seed, but you also had a colony of milkweed bugs on them, if you don't pick those fruit soon, the milkweed bugs will totally suck all the good stuff out of the seed and that seed, seed won't be viable anymore. So you got to pay, pay attention because all seeds not created equal if you wait too long. But then you could take this seed head, bend it over like a paper bag, and then cut the seed heads off. And then you can go and hang them in a, in a warm, dry location. And then the seeds will drop out of the pods naturally. And then once you have all those seeds in a bag, then you have to take the seeds out and get rid of the chaff. Now here, it shows you, it's circled in red. That is the echinacea seed. At least I think it's either a teasel or a net, something in that family, but I thought maybe it would be echinacea. You can see the chaff and then what the seed looks like. In some cases, the seed is very fine, which it makes it hard. Sometimes if you have something to get your fingers a little damp or the eraser and a pencil, you know, push, push it aside because sometimes they're hard to get hold of. And then once you have all these seeds, you need to remember that they're a living thing. So you have to store them properly or they won't last and be viable anymore. A tightly sealed container in the refrigerator is great. I know Earth Sangha, I don't remember her name, but the lady who started that whole thing, um, she keeps all her seeds in the refrigerator. And I know she says she has a refrigerator in every room of her house. But jars and tins are great. Like tins, like say that you, especially the smaller tins that you can get like loose leaf tea or something or jars like uh, prescription bottles, maybe. You want to make sure your jars are clean and, and disinfected and all that too. And then you want to keep them under low humidity in a cool, dry place. But the temperatures cannot drop below 40 degrees. And those, the life of those seeds could be like one to five years. Uh, so now we, we, we talk about factors to consider, whether it's seeds or cutting. And you know, you can say media, medium, soil, it's all the same if they're talking about what you're going to plant your seeds or cutting in. And then there's the containers and all these other things which we'll go over right now. So for the media, 
you can buy it or you can make your own. There's a lot of recipes online for making your own potting soil. But and, and the thing you have to remember is what if you're planting seeds is that this, the soil has to be fine. In some cases, you can go out and buy starter soil, which is a little more expensive than regular potting soil. But I'm going to tell you later about something I do to spread that out a little bit so I don't have to buy so much of it. For cuttings, you want it to be well aerated and loose, not big pieces. There are some potting soils I'll buy and they actually almost look like they have mulch in them. The pieces are so big. And for cuttings, that is just too much. But you do have to have, like I said, well aerated. And your potting soil, say if you overwinter potting soil from last season, which is fine. I mean, I keep mine inside of a trash can outside. But I still have had problems where I have, will find ant colonies in there. I, I how. There's only one little hole that I plug with a cork, but they still sometimes get in there. You, wanna, you don't wanna always put the insects and then even weed seeds that the ants could bring in when you're planting seeds yourself. But you, your, your soil mixture has to be capable of holding moisture. So peat can really dry out and be hard to re, re wet. So if you're doing cuttings, you might wanna add a little perlite for, to create air spaces. There's always vermiculite as well, but you need to realize that vermiculite actually holds moisture too. So consider what plant you took a cutting of. And again, no fertilizing at this stage. You don't wanna stress the plant. And here are some of the containers you can use. There's, and you can buy the big fancy ones from the store. There's the one with the person's hand in it. That shows you a blocker again. It shows you how, how they do that. You put this, the blocker, you bring up the handle while it's in the soil and you go and release the handle and you get all these little squares that have the hole already there. The important thing with all these things is, is that they're clean and they have holes in them for drainage. And then you have to worry about how much humidity your plants have. You have to have the humidity there. And when you start, you should hopefully won't have to water as often because you have plastic over it. And you can use a bag, you can use glass, anything that light can go through. And your soil shouldn't remain moist, but you never want excess so and you may not have to add any if you can get the humidity at the right spot. Once you start seeing germination, you take the lid off because you don't want the seedling to be too wet. Once it has the green, that's something that can then be damaged from too much moisture. The seeds will damp off and the cuttings will rot if they're too moist. So, and the other thing, if you have too much water is you won't have enough oxygen either. So do not keep your soil soaked. Only water when the top is, is dry. And again, avoid splashing because it can spread disease. And temperatures, we want temperatures 60 to 75 degrees is, is best. You can create this with um, heating pads, propagation mats. Some people have, there's all kinds of clever methods. Like I said, if you go out and search around, you might find other ways. And then once germination and rooting starts, you got to lower the temperature a bit because it prevents you getting that leggy look where then your plant falls over. You can, like I said, you can cool with fans. Light is a stimulator. So remember that. That's why you can have a light, one that you can grate, sometimes a, a grow light, which I didn't know this until I saw this slide that you can have one cool and one warm. Because some of the um, plant growing lights have gotten quite expensive. But the amount of light a plant needs varies by species. So 
that's another thing to research as well. And then we get to the place where we got to be careful. After all your work, you, you want your seedlings to succeed. So you have to carefully get them out of their little pots to put in the larger pot. In some cases, you can maybe have a, um, a mat or a piece of paper towel or whatever and dump the pot out carefully. And then you can, with your fingers or say like, um, a plant label or a small, maybe a plastic knife, just move them aside and then try to get the little plants out, grab them by their leaves, don't grab them by their roots or even the stem because the stem, I've had this happen where the stem just snaps and then all you have are roots. And you could try to get, you could plant it anyway and hope, but you sort of increased its time to become a plant if it does become a plant. And then you have your potting soil again with a hole in it. And you, this time you can probably use like your finger to make the hole. You put the little plant in and try to put it the same depth it was in the, when it was in the original pot. And at this point, if you want, you can fertilizer, but you want to use half strength liquid fertilizer. So here we go, we're almost to actually having a plant that we can use. We have to harden them off. So now you have these in the pot and you have to harden them off to about 45 to 50 degrees, which means once the weather is warm enough outside, you put them outside during the day. But if it's going to get down colder than that, you have to bring them in at night. And in the beginning, you probably only wanna leave them out. I, for a few hours and never in the hot sun. You want the, the plant to grow, to grow. You want slow growth. You don't want it to immediately get tall and too, you know, quickly, and you don't want it to stop growing because it's too cold. Some way to check your seed especially if you had seed for a while or another way to also get your seed started, maybe a, you know, a quicker is you can take some soil that you have wet, squeeze the excess water out of it, and then you put the seeds in the soil in a baggie all mixed together and leave it in the refrigerator for one to four weeks. And then you could take it out and plant in warmer temps. Now we're going to talk about, which I, this is fun. Winter sowing, it's just, it's fun to do this because that you put them out when there's still snow on the ground. You can do this in starting in January and into February. And these just show you some of the containers that we're going to use to make mini greenhouses. Here's a whole slew of them. And you can see how they've repurposed a lot of things. Here are the milk jugs again. And in the lower right corner, I think these are some of those crazy drinks you get with the big straws in them. So we're gonna keep all these things outside. So you, and you're gonna put them on your deck or on an uncovered porch or even in a flower bed because you want them to be out in a sunny location because you want condensation in the closed containers. So we can use plastic or foil containers. And like I said, anything that has a clear lid and it has to be deep enough to hold the two or three inches of soil and it has had the headroom to let the plant grow. All these containers must be clean. So if you're repurposing something, hot soapy water and rinse, and it says drain, but I think it should be dry, sorry. Now you gotta put ventilation holes and drainage holes in as well, except for the milk jugs. Then they don't need ventilation. You just take the cap off, get rid of that. You don't need it and put holes in the bottom and you cut your gallon jug in half and put the medium in and either the, in the seed, and then you tape it back together. And these, these conditions 
any of these um, containers are good for perennials, biennials, and cool season vegetables. Also, anything that says it'll self-sow or that you can put it in outdoors early autumn or early spring. This Facebook page will tell you a lot more about it. I'm going to go back here because I didn't go in enough until the holes. When you see these holes on these containers, there will be a time, say, that if you're not getting condensation in your container, it means your ventilation holes in the lids may be too big. So what you can do is tape some of the holes up. Or if your container is holding too much water, it means your holes in the bottom are too small. And this is important. I use a nail that's about three inches tall and the tip on it is not quite as big as a pencil for the hole. You can see the holes in there, you, but you, like I said, it's like a little trial and error. It's your first time you can try a couple containers and put in different size and you can see which does the best for you. I just didn't want to forget that part, sorry. Okay, so here are some resources, both for, um, for propagation and growing. A lot, probably a lot more information that you want, but just know that it's out there and often you can find these online. This is the S Southern Exposure Seed Exchange and Ira Wallace is the one that started this. It, she gives talks sometimes, which are great. And like I said, they have so many different kinds of seeds. And this is great too, because you know, we used to have a nursery in our area, DeBaggio's, where you could go and get plants like 12 different kinds of basil and 50 different kinds of tomatoes, and they're not here anymore. So heirloom seeds will help you get all those different vegetables, and in some cases, some um, perennials and annuals as well. And these are some more resources, a little more involved. At the bottom is Lisa Ziegler's website. But like I said, if you just remember the Gardener's Workshop, you'll find her. And again, like the, this will all be, this PowerPoint will be posted on our YouTube channel and you'll have all this information. This is the one I kept saying that if you wanna know about all the different types of propagation and cuttings in depth, it's great information. Remember when you look for information, it's nice if you can find .edu information because then you know it's backed up by research. And I thank you. And this is how you can reach all of us. If you have a question, you can send a question to the help desk, which, and that's the email, Master Gardener. Thank okay. you. We've got some questions for you. Um, first, I'd like to say, unfortunately, for those of you who joined late, the recording had a glitch at the beginning and we missed the first minute or so, but um, the rest of it will be recorded and put on YouTube. Uh, also on our YouTube channel, um, we do have one of Ira Wallace's talks on there, so you can check that out as well. So our first question is, what's the best medium for propagating, um, which you addressed a little bit, but yeah, I, I still, like I said, for seeds, sometimes, especially if you're new at it, just buy the more expensive potting soil and get the starter uh, soil. Uh, and like I said, if you're more, if you've had more experience, what I do in the lettuce boxes often is I buy potting soil that I know doesn't have from the, have big lumps in it. It's finer. And again, when you buy potting soil, do not buy any potting soil. Like um, you're, you muted yourself, Leslie. We got do not buy potting soil, and then you went on mute. You're still on mute. That is, I don't, that's crazy. Uh, do not buy potting soil with fertilizer in it or that moisture stuff, you know, where it says it retains moisture to get started because then you have no control over anything. You want straight, usually I tell people buy the cheapest potting soil 
unless it's your house plants that you established house plants. But you can put an inch of potting soil that has no big chunks in the lettuce box. And then I put the next two inches, I put potting soil because the seed is going to be planted in the top like inch at the most. And because you don't bury it very deeply and that'll be fine. That'll work. But I'll, like I said, it's any potting soil that doesn't have big pieces in it. If you're doing cuttings, yes, you can have some perlite in it, but not, you, not um, moisture proof or anything, or, or mo moisture aid or whatever they call it. I don't know what they call it. I also have read that a couple of the um, garden centers are going to have a peat-free potting soil this year. Oh. For those that <clears throat> I'm not going to not going to name them because. But yeah, I know you can just <laughs> uh, when you go in, you can ask for if if that's something you're concerned about using the too much peat because of sustainability issues. You can ask exactly, and I I forgot I, I didn't have that written down. You need to realize that peat's not a renewable resource, so us buying it just caused them to, to dig up more peat bogs that take thousands of years to form. So that's something. It is something to think about. Does that um, answer? Yeah, that should answer that. One other thing too. Um, oh, I had a thought and now I, I lost it. Um, we'll come back to you. Yeah. So we had another question about the best way to propagate natives like Joe Pye weed and, and asters. Um, well, you, you can use um, one of the, um, the cutting methods especially if you're um, asked, you know, when asters are well established, they're almost a shrub, really. So you could, you know, do one of them where you bring the branch down, or you could try a kip, a, excuse me, a tip cutting, but you need to do the cutting in spring or early summer. Okay. Um... And, you know, Thomas, the other thing, I don't have that many pictures in this PowerPoint, which might mean that the slides could be posted somewhere or the PowerPoint could be posted somewhere. Okay. Um, next question, how important is it or how important is thinning seedlings and what's the best way to do that? I find it's, it's easiest when you take them out of the container, they grew to that height in. And then if you see any of them where, like I said, if you bent a, a stem or the leaves just don't look right, then I, I pull them aside. It really begins, it, it, it depends for me how much time I have that day and how much patience. If I have a lot of patience, then I take all the bad ones out. But sometimes I will put the ones that look sort of iffy somewhere else and just cross my fingers and hope they grow. And if they don't, then I use that soil for something else. Because I often reuse the potting soil, not for cuttings and seed starting, but for other, like when we have a plant sale at our garden, instead of buying new potting soil all the time, I will go and mix up all my potting soil in a wheelbarrow, wet it, and maybe put some fertilizer in it to, for when we dig up plants for our plant sale. So the other thing I would add to that is, um, particularly when you're dealing with uh, plants that have really tiny seeds and it's hard to control mm. them spacing and you've got them all kind of bunched up together. Um, using scissors sometimes is- Or even a tweezers. Or tweezers, yeah, it is sometimes better than trying to pull them. That way you don't pull up a clump of them and you can selectively choose exactly which plants you want to keep and which ones you don't want to keep. And if you can find a child's fork or even a plastic fork, you know, something that has, or a seafood fork, you know what I mean? Because I'm looking for something that has shorter times on it. So but again, a, a popsicle stick will work too. There's a question, when starting season doors, how long into the growing season can I use grow lights and should they be turned off at night? That I, you, Thomas, do you know the answer to that? I yep, don't. I do. Um, so 
you can keep them on as, you know, as long as you want in the growing season, but it, you know, there's a point at which you're going to want to take them and put them outside. Um, right now in my office, I have basil that's been growing for several months now uh, <laughs> under a grow light. Um, but I do have it on a timer. You need to allow, so. The darkness, uh, right? Yeah, you need to allow the darkness, but you also need to think about the plant as a living creature. Um, just like plants use carbon dioxide um, to make their sugar, they also respire and give off carbon dioxide at night. And so um, you want to have it, you want to have your lights on a timer um, so that they have a, a dark photo period. And depending on the plant would depend really on how long of a they should be on lights and how long they should be off. Right. Um, our next question was, what is the web website for winter sewing? Hang on. I was just thinking about, wait a minute, where is this? There it is at the bottom there. I put Facebook and winter sew and found it. And what was the link for propagation materials? <clears throat> well, there is a, a very large winter sewing Facebook page. Yeah, that's we, the one. Yeah. That, that the, yeah, that's the link I had up. But we also have a video um, on oh. our YouTube channel that we gave about a month ago, I think. Yes. So it should be up on the YouTube channel. Um, let's see. I used to grow orchids under one cool and one warm fluorescent light, but can't find them labeled that way at the hardware stores now. So that, yeah, that can be a challenge. Um, what about the new light bulbs? Do they? So there are LED lights that um, have both warm and cool yeah. light. Um, that's what we're looking for. Wavelengths. Um, and you can use LEDs, to, but uh, a lot of times you have to look at the fine print on the light bulb. Um, and so it's not always as easy to tell. Um, but the other thing you can do is you can take down the number of the light, its SKU number, call the company and say, hey, I'm trying to find a warm season fluorescent light. Is this the right number or can you give me the right number? That's a good idea. Thomas, can, can you also find that lighting um, in pet stores? I mean, don't they have similar lighting for aquariums sometimes? Uh, I'm not sure what the, aquari what the aquarium lights are, if they're soft or, or warm lights. The same is true with reptile lights. I don't know if it, Reptile lights probably don't matter, but um, with aquariums, I'm not 100% sure. Um, we you also, know, the, before what, you go on, there's one other thing when I was thinking about like the Joe Pye weed. If you have a, a, a plant that grows, it, it, even if it's a perennial, it grows more like a shrub, you can actually, sometimes you can do it. We've done it at the garden with false indigo where you can actually dig down and take pieces off. We've done it with sweet shrub. We've done it with clephra. There are some plants that you can get new plants from just by splitting the roots. So in some cases, like with asters, you probably could do that with as well. Sorry, Thomas. I was just going to say, Jimmy uh, offered a comment right. that uh, for his tomatoes, uh, 16 hours on and eight hours off with the lights works well with most vegetables. Um, that's a pretty good, most of our warm season vegetables, I should say, um, probably you don't need quite that much time on light with, uh, your brassicas and your lettuces and things like that. Well, thank you all for joining us. And this will be up on Facebook or not Facebook up on YouTube, uh, here in a day or two. And we look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leslie. Thanks.
Thank, Thank you, you Leslie. Congress. Great job. Take care.